Catalyst 2030 started life as a WhatsApp group among social entrepreneurs, connecting to envision real transformational change. Launched at the World Economic Forum in January 2020, it's grown into a global movement accelerating change to ensure the SDGs are reached by 2030. Fueled by passion, our 550 members working in 175 countries have collectively put in an amazing 50,000 volunteer hours, touching the lives of 2 billion people. And we're driven by values, to which we hold ourselves accountable. 2020 was a busy year, co-creating three reports partners and producing one of our own. Inviting high-level guests to participate in the Catalyzing Change campaign, hosting fireside chats and expert hours, which will be continuing in 2021. To celebrate our achievements, together we placed our supporters in the limelight with the first Catalyst 2030 Awards for Systemic Change. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, we celebrated finalists and winners in the following categories. Special recognition for our early supporters, individual philanthropists, donor organizations, philanthropic intermediaries, corporate organizations, bi- and multilateral organizations, and four regional winners in the category of national governments. And now on to Catalyzing Change Week 2021. During this social entrepreneur-led event, we bring together diverse stakeholders in over 100 sessions to showcase their systems change efforts and the best practices that can accelerate our work in pursuit of the SDGs. Hi everyone, welcome. It's so lovely to see you all here and I'm so grateful that you, we can have your time and attention today. Uh, my name is Julia. I facilitate the food security and agriculture issue-based group of Catalyst 2030. Um, so I'm very excited to, uh, you know, have this event and showcase these wonderful and amazing people. Um, just a quick housekeeping thing is um, we will be recording this and uploading this session to the Catalyst 2030 YouTube. So the session will be available after this, which is wonderful. But if you have any privacy concerns, uh, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, and now over to our wonderful moderator, Sarah Roversi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be with you today. Actually, I'm in this journey of Catalyst 2030 since uh, a little bit. I had the chance to get inspired by other sessions, uh, and I think it's really a great source uh, of inspiration, learning, and an energy also for all of us. I'm very glad today to be with you, and I have to thank, first of all, our friend uh, Mark Brand. That is for sure a great mentor and a great source of learning for the entire global community of people that want really to change the world starting from food. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics. We all know how much we need to reboot the system. Everybody's talking just about the food system, but I strongly believe that food is at the epicenter and so we have to reboot the system thinking about how might we educate people, how might we transform industry, how might we really shift from the status quo to a more, not only greener solution, greener agriculture, but regenerative environment, a regenerative ecosystem. And today, of course, we're gonna talk about one of the powerhouse within the society women and the power of women and the source of life. And I'm super glad because um, I'm going to know many interesting stories of people that are making impact in their daily life within their communities. And now all around the world, I have to see that basically since when the sustainable development goals were announced five, almost six years ago, many things have been accelerated. And this year, for sure, also with the UN Food Systems Summit, I think that the global awareness about this topic is going to raise so much. But still, there is a lot to do. And days like today and projects like Catalyst are amazing to show best practices. And in these five years, I've been really seeing how through best practices and people like all of you that are joining today, 
we can really make a huge impact inspiring others. So this is what we're going to do today. And I really look forward now to learn from your stories and connect this amazing group of people. And I want to start with a friend, a friend that I met in London many years ago in another environment. We were not talking about the power of women in agriculture, but we were talking about food and innovation. And we were already inspired by all the big challenges of this system. We're talking about the challenges of the system, but also we were talking about uh, actually what's going to be the future of food. And here we are, this is going to be the gang today. So we have Charles from Bogota, we have Cherry, Teresa, Rosemary and Nicola, and we're going to go all the way around the world. And I would say, let's start this conversation. And I want to start from you, Charles. So please tell us Hello. what are you doing? What are the inspiring stories you're seeing? What do you want to share with this amazing audience? Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's such a pleasure to be here. Just to to know how much um, how many how much how many minutes do you want me to share? I have uh, a few stories I would love to share, but we have uh, ninety minutes of dance okay. together. Okay. So Beautiful. I think we can just start with the first round, and then we mm -hmm. go with the flow. Okay. So I'll start with um, with the story. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to introduce a little bit um, kind of uh, what I do and and how I got where I am. So I. Um, I am a, um, kind of started as a food technician, right? I prefer saying food technician than chef, um, but I worked in, in, in restaurants and in fine dining, uh, but quickly, very quickly realized that um, um, the power of food was not necessarily at its most you know, powerful and needed expression in, in the fine dining restaurant. Of course, they play a, a very important role in innovating and creating this amazing um, you know, uh, flavors and working with the best produce that the earth has to give. But at the same time, in, in my mind, as I was 21, 22 years old, like there is so much more that needs to be done with food. And so I got into, um, into a whole journey in the past decade between, um, you know, doing artistic practice with food, um, also doing scientific research on, in experimental psychology in particular, trying to understand um, the whole academic landscape around food as well. Um, and in, in, in recent years, it uh, became uh, a food educator. I find that, uh, you know, food literacy is, is such an important um, aspect of, um, of the change we want to see in the world. If we don't connect with the most intimate, um, uh, you know, experience that we have in connecting, relating to each other and relating to the natural ecosystems that surround us, um, we will have a hard time finding solutions, right? So this education, this pleasure in beauty and in the experiences when, of when we eat are so important also for nutrition and addressing all these issues that we're talking about. So from that angle uh, also, um, and, and with, as a, an activist at heart, uh, I've been you know, traveling and, and, and seeing different aspects of, um, of, of these challenges that we're facing when it comes to the food landscape. And there's one story I want to share with you. So right now I'm in Bogota, um, originally called Bacata in Kipcha language. Um, this is uh, originally uh, Muisca territory. Um, and it's something that, you know, acknowledging the land is, is something that is so important um, nowadays. So um, in this land, right, Bogota is a city of 8 million people, um, 8, 9 million people, uh, very complex, very, very big. And, um, and uh, a few uh, months ago, I was invited by um, um, the um, BID, the Inter-American Development Bank, um, to do uh, a documentary on the, um, um, the importance of traditional markets. Um, and uh, I had the chance to meet an incredible uh, woman, uh, a farmer, uh, Sandra Peñalosa. Um, and if I may, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I, I just want to have a, a couple pictures here. I just want to share with you uh, quickly. So this is uh, Sandra uh, Peñalosa uh, that I want to, to, to show uh, you and, and explain for just a few minutes um, the amazing work that, that she's been doing as a, as a leader of uh, 150 families in the south of Bogota. Um, Sandra is um, 
uh, was just, you know, let's say a conventional farmer um, at the, on the outskirts of the city. And through the pandemic, um, seeing that everything was changing about a year and a half ago, she decided to uh, shift her, her operation to become an organic farmer. Um, and, um, you know, with limited resources, um, they figured out a way to, you know, with the information that they could get um, to understand what organic farming was in that particular land. This is incredible pieces of land that are actually um, uh, high in the mountains near the Paramo. This is her family. Um, and, um, and we were talking about, uh, you know, the different seeds that, um, that were working and the way they were working before, which was um, generally kind of using kind of conventional farming techniques, including glyphosate and all, um, you know, um, and, 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 and the seeds that were most available commercially for a particular, um, for the market, let's say that, that the demand in Bogota. And um, there's several things, right, that, that to, to share here that are just incredibly amazing about this story, but in particular, um, two aspects of it. One is that uh, she decided to integrate beekeeping into her practice. Um, and, and so she is now uh, placing uh, bees at high altitude and she's also collaborating with other women leaders in, in the south of, uh, of Bogota uh, to share practices, to share good practices around uh, beekeeping to generate a new income stream. And beekeeping, uh, let's remember, is, is such a, a you know, an integral part of a healthy ecosystem, uh, right? Bees pollinate, bees produce pollen, which is a source of protein. Bees produce honey, of course, which is a, a highly valuable commercial product, but also very good for uh, the family's nutrition um, and also propolis, that is um, a, a natural antiseptic, antiviral and, and, and a beautiful medicine that bees capture in their landscapes. So as a tool of resilience, they chose to go for beekeeping and they've been doing it and, and spreading the word uh, around beekeeping. So she's become a beekeeper expert in the past years. Um, and this is something that she had no practice on. She just took the initiative to do it. Um, another aspect that I found fascinating, and by the way, the, the, the honey that she's producing is in protected areas that are at risk deforestation right now, um, like high paramos that are places that retain a lot of water. Um, and, um, and this very specific ecosystem high in altitude, above 3000 meters in the Andes mountains. And, um, and the bees are very important for the health of this ecosystem, right? Cross-pollinating all the plants in this particular. So she's actually protecting the natural ecosystems and creating an income source from these beautiful landscapes. Um, and the, the other thing that she told me was that was really inspiring was that we have you know, hundreds of varieties of potatoes in Colombia. And there's only um, maybe three or four that you find in every supermarket. And even in every popular market, there's only three or four. There's only a few markets, especially in the south of Colombia, where you find 10, 20 varieties of potatoes. But traditionally, right, ancestrally, the type of seeds that were used by um, you know, by, by, by farmers, uh, by people in the countryside, uh, were much more diverse than what they are now. She found out that the potato that the market demands needs glyphosate in order to be able to be, you know, sustainable financially. She decided to go back to the older, um, the more ancestral varieties of potatoes, which are rarely seen in supermarkets, and she realized that these, these varieties of plants were perf like were um, perfectly kind of adapted to the ecosystem and hence they did not need any type of pesticide or herbicide. They, the plants had evolved, co-evolved with the ecosystem in a way that was um, uh, like, let's say organic by nature. And, and that is her initiative. And, um, and so Sandra, I mean, I could talk more longer, but I don't want to take more space. Uh, Sandra, just this, the, you know, this, this leader was truly inspiring to me to see how um, they are examples of resilience. They are examples of finding new ways of uh, creating nutrition uh, out of the landscape in a way that is regenerative, that is sustainable, beyond sustainable even. Um, and, uh, and also how she's organizing over 150 families uh, and inspiring people around her. This uh, young woman who is also part of her community is studying cooking, cuisine, um, in the city. And uh, she has this incredible story as well. And she's one of the, 
the, the woman who is um, part of the community that Sandler has created right now of woman leadership uh, in the south of Bogota to improve their food sovereignty and also create and bring healthier products to the market. So this is just kind of a little story from here, Bogota, uh, from Huizca territory, territory here in, in, in South America that I wanted to share with you all as an introduction. Um, and, um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for listening. Um, this is um, Charles Michel um, from Bogota and I'm happy to, uh, to pass the, the baton of the word for to someone else. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Charles. In your world, basically, you have been mentioning collaboration, connection, biodiversities, land. I think that when we're talking about women in agriculture, we are talking really about prosperity at large. And I think that this is one of the main pillars. When I hear stories that are involving women, you always hear about stories uh, that are rooted in collaboration. And this is, I think, something pretty unique. And now let's start to connect the dots. I want to involve uh, Cherry with us. Grow her and your oh. projects. I think that you have tons of other little pieces of the puzzle to add. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much, everyone, you know, uh, for inviting me to speak here. It's actually late evening in Manila. I'm from the Philippines and I'm so inspired by Charles. I'm doing this for the love of work and for the love of Nikki and the SGM community and Mark and everyone here. Uh, I actually prepared a little bit of presentation. It's because, you know, I want to you to... I want to give you a little bit of context of where we're coming from in the Philippines. So I'll try to share my screen. I'll be quick with this introduction and later on I can just add up. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, you know, I started teaching farmers at the age of 12. So basically my company is a women-led and women-owned um, you know, company. And I started with this. It's a very important a quote for me, my mom told me when I was six years old, it's not enough to be successful, you should also be relevant. And I think in terms of telling story, my mom is, uh, I grew up in a farm because my parents are farmers, they are into sugarcane farming in the Philippines, it's the number one uh, industry. But uh, I was growing up asking always around why children around me are not in school, you know, why people are so poor. And one time at 11, I read a book and the book says, if you're poor, 70% of your income goes to rice because in the Philippines, it's not a meal without rice. 30% goes to your viand, you know, to ulam. But then my mom would always tell me that I'm investing in you as a person because I want you to connect the shortest distance in life. The distance of your brain and your heart, that's, a, that, that's the shortest distance. And, you know, growing up, I always wanted to do investment to a lot of women in the communities and a lot of women, not only in the community, but more importantly, in the farming community. So I started, you know, so many ventures and I actually ran away from home at 15 because my mom wanted me to be a doctor and I wanted to be a farmer and it's just like unacceptable because, oh, you're a class valedictorian. Why you need to be a farmer? Why you need to go to agriculture? So I left home, I ran away at 15. My mom said, you send yourself to school. So I sent myself to school. I became a working student, tried to apply scholarship left and right. And, you know, to make the story short, I started my own venture. And in all the course of our venture, I always believe in the power of moving forward and this forward we actually make the w in the middle bigger making the women center and front of our work so in all our programs we do the finding opportunities and roles of women in agriculture and rural development if you see in this picture if you're working in my company i don't care if you're a model or you're graduated in ivy league school you need to work on the farm you need to live in the farmer's house drink coffee and eat breakfast with the farmers early morning and sleep in their house to know them. So this is my team. A lot of us are women. And these are some of the women, you know, in, in the Philippines that we organize. In the picture at the bottom, every year we hold a roundtable discussion, including the indigenous people leaders, the first woman IP leader, and then also the, the Muslim communities in the Philippines to just have a discussion about 
how do we move agriculture forward? And we're actually, you know, doing a policy about it. Um, I also thought of sharing this with you because this is such a feat, you know, a uh, success in the farm school. It's a teamwork, actually. Uh, in 2016 and 2017, I started opening a farm school in the Philippines. It's like one of the first farm school in the country because I get so irritated. You know, farmers are, are at 60 years old with an average educational attainment of like 10 years old in school. But the most uh, difficult one is actually to encouraging women to go into school and be trained. In three years, we're so successful. If you see the number, our women enrolled is around 63% of the entire enrollment in our school. And this is such a big leap. And now our school is an A-star school in the whole country. And we're replicating it to have uh, other you know, courses. Um, this one is, you know, it's powerful. Uh, it's actually supported by SGM. We're part of the Food Solidarity Fund and we made this happen. But what's beautiful in here, it's about the power of women. You know, a lot of the women in the food supply chain we work, but more importantly, during this pandemic, I always believe we don't live in isolation. We are in a world where we need everyone. And more importantly, we are in a world that this pandemic will make us more resilient. And for me, every time I see the word resiliency and I want to define it, I always define it that resiliency is equivalent to women. No bias to you, Charles, but resiliency is always equivalent to women. You know, like the first time we said that we need to hashtag plantdemic in the whole country. Now more than 3,000 women is doing plantdemic. They're planting in their own backyard, the power of growing their own food in the poorest, um, you know, communities in the urban setting. So now this is a very powerful story. Uh, now it will be implemented all over the country, this hashtag plantdemic, because it inspired, you know, not only the urban poor communities, but the entire, you know, decision makers and our leaders of our country to adopt. But what's more important, actually, on a global level, uh, I co-founded a movement. It's called Grow Her. We launched it in Asia Pacific. It's a community-based microsite, basically. But now it's empowering and telling stories of women all over Asia Pacific. And we're reaching out to Africa also. And if you want to, you know, to replicate it there in your area in Latin America, we're more open to do that. Uh, we launched this in the Philippines, and now um, Indonesia wants to launch this in their country this year. Vietnam is also launching their country. So it's a movement that on a country level, they're adapting. And lastly, that launch actually of Grow Her became our first food systems individual dialogue in the Philippines, where we got Gerda Verborg uh, to speak. And I share this with you because this is very important as what she said. When women come together, they create the power of we. And that is exactly what is happening in Grow Her, you know, in this movement that we created. From the power of she, woman, to the power of we, women together. Uh, to close my talk, I'll share you a um, manifesto video that we actually used during the launch of Grow Her. So it's in Filipino, but there's like a subtitle. Um, Dati, naghihintay lang ako. Ngayon, nasa kamay ko na ang pagbuhay sa aking pamilya. Isa pang salita ang nadagdag sa aking pagkatao. Babae, kapatid, at magsasaka. Babae, anak, at magsasaka. Babae, asawa, at magsasaka. Babae, ina, at magsasaka. Tulad ng aking mga pananim na lumalago, lumalago din ako sa aking sikap, sa aking dunong, at sa aking pangalan. the end.
end of my quick presentation. Uh, hopefully, you know, you're inspired in what we're doing here from this side of the world, and I'm happy to, to share more insights later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so inspired because you have been talking a lot also about education and how much education has been crucial. And the fact that you have been brave to take the decision to go and study. And this is something that we should all share also with youth now. It's such an important thing to rely on science and invest in education overall, giving access to young ladies everywhere in the world to quality education. It's really one of the most important priority because what we see that when there is poverty in education, there is also not equality, there is tons of other issues related. So education for sure is the starting point. And now let's start to connect the dots within the food chain. We have been talking a lot about farming experiences and those incredible experiences shared by women in farming. And now I would love to start to talk about cooking. And what you were saying is pretty interesting because it connects me also to another initiative that I know that is La Cocina in San Francisco. La Cocina has been a very great source of inspiration for me because this has been one of the first social incubator that I met and I was such inspired by those people that said I want to invest in women because when you invest in women women take care about the society if you invest just in men men take care about friends and the fact that you are touching women you're touching families through women you're touching the entire community and they were cooking there were tons of women cooking and I want to invite Nicola with us. She is, uh, of course, talking about social gastronomy and stories coming from very inspiring kitchen. Thank you so much, Sara, and, and thanks, Sherry, Charles. I mean, you always touch my heart <laughs> every time we speak and I every time learn something new, which is um, what life is about, right? Um, so I, I had a lot of notes. I'm like, what am I going to start with? And oh my God, yes, invest in a woman, invest in her community. You know, like there's so many facts out there. And when I was preparing for, for today as well, I was looking in our network, like what are these inspiring women? And um, I think I'd need an hour and a half just to touch about one fifth of what I would want to if I shared all of the stories. So I'm gonna be very selective and um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So you'll have to bear uh, with my face and with my words, <laughs> um, but I'll hopefully be able to represent um, both stories uh, that I'd like to share with all of you today. Um, and I'm gonna go a little back when actually, um, well, wait, no, I'm gonna say, what is the social gastronomy movement? And then I'll tell the story. I think that would, uh, that would help to connect those dots. Uh, so the social gastronomy movement is a um, global community and network of amazing change agents, um, chefs, cooks, um, social entrepreneur, academics, farmers, um, that all believe in the power of a we um, that Sherry's video was referring to, but really going from me to we. Um, and so that's us, the power of us that can really shift the food system to be more equitable, to be more just, to be good for people, but also for the planet. And um, I truly believe just by having a few of our community members here on this panel, I truly believe that this is, we are uh, the change that we will see in society. And so this is what the social gastronomy movement is about, really connecting um, those dots across um, across the food cycle. So um, again, I mentioned who's part of a network. So it goes from, from a farmer to the chef that will actually bring the plate towards the consumer, but also consumers are part of the network because we need to connect all of these dots. And so um, we our magic recipe that was co-created with entire communities, actually CCPs, connecting, collaborating and creating partnerships. So I loved Sada when you resumed um, Charles's speech by saying um, collaboration, connection came across really strongly because these are two of the very important um, pieces in our recipe. So I, um, I love how things are falling into, into flow right here. Um, so I said, I'm gonna start with a story and I actually wanna start with um, 
two very personal stories <laughs> because I I found my my identity for the women um, the traditional women in my um, in my life so um, the ancient wisdom of cultures and so um, I really I'm I'm originally Polish and um, I was taken out of my country at a young age and so I was really looking for that identity where do I belong who am I and um, looking back at what is culture I started realizing that. Um, I am the sum of the recipes of my ancestors. <laughs> so I, um, I really started believing that I, I am Polish because I know what we eat. I know where our food comes from. I know our traditions. And so I started taking this pride. So that is where early on it touched me. Um, but I have the power in me to be who I want, to do what I want. And, and I that power I got from the women in my family. So that's just a little um, anecdote around me. And then the second moment that um, it became really um, really clear to me the power of women was um, when I joined uh, my friend Chef David Hertz in Gastromotiva in Brazil. And uh, we were co-leading um, that NGO that really focuses on um, education as well and giving opportunities. Um, so that transformation through food. And um, one of the courses is just to educate um, young people that don't have opportunities that um, some of us have educating uh, towards working in kitchens, right? So I was referring to the kitchens. Um, but also there's a second program that emerged that became extremely relevant as I joined in 2015. Um, it's the entrepreneurs course where we would educate um, exactly the same group of people. So kids from the favelas or uh, refugees that, that didn't have opportunities in very new countries. And um, the entrepreneurs training is to empower at the same time, but to be food entrepreneurs. And um, I realized how important this became because um, educating a lot of women in our program at Gastromotiva towards working in kitchens, they stayed in the kitchens for a year, for two, and then there were a lot of dropouts. And understanding this dropout, we said, wow, okay, well, there's a different reality that a woman um, faces, which is, you know, especially in the Latin American countries that we are represented. Um, the woman um, has to take care of her kids oftentimes. There's no support system. They have, um, so they don't manage to do the long hours in the kitchen. So the entrepreneurs course became an incredible tool to actually include this woman that were amazing at, at cooking because that's, you know, they, they've been doing that over years and years for their own families, providing, nurturing. And so the entrepreneurs course really became focused on women and um, empowering them to also use these skills that they, uh, that they learn, but becoming their own um, entrepreneurs. And I think that's the second time where I personally said, wow, uh, we need to think about, you know, the course that was for everyone, out of a sudden became exclusive somewhat because of a reality that a lot of the girls that were being trained by Gastromotiva were facing. So I think um, that was the story I wanted to bring that really touched me. And one of these girls um, was Uridea. She actually um, is from one of the favelas in, in Sao Paulo. She was um, David's first, <laughs> first student actually and I made the program what it is. And um, Coming back to the point that investing in a woman, you invest in the community, you, you invest in feeding the family, the community and the world. As the title here says, women will feed the world. And so Uridea became a student. She struggled, she worked in kitchens and then eventually she did the entrepreneur's course as well and became her own entrepreneur nowadays. And COVID didn't help that situation, but she's still very resilient. Um, she has her own catering, employing 15 other students so giving uh, the piece of employment as well. Um, she is by now with COVID, she responded um, by not only doing her, obviously that was interrupted, the uh, catering services, but she started serving her local community. She said, I have a kitchen, I have a people, we, we're gonna organize the food, we'll, we'll make it happen. And so she started um, feeding her local community. And um, it's really beautiful to see, because I think there are this, this example and many more that I was thinking about, um, what I see that women bring as well is the piece of patience, the thinking outside of the box. And there's so many examples of that, like AgroSmart or Ethic Hub, but I can share a few more um, inspiring examples after. Um, and women by nature are nurturers. And so that taking care of um, comes so natural. And so you see that in, in a lot of them, like I think um, if women are provided access to the right tools, access to education, um, the world will be a much better place. 
and uh, we will actually feed the world. Um, the FAO actually brought out a FAO that I know that um, Future Food Institute works really closely with is um, if women had access to the same info and resources as men, up to 150 million people could be lifted out of poverty only by that. And I think that is, you know, there are numbers. You're referring to science. Yes, there is science for this. There is actually, you know, real examples. So, so what are we waiting for? It's not women are the future. Women are the present. And um, especially when it comes to, to nurturing, to feeding, to taking care, and um, not only of, of us as a society, but our planet. So I think that's what I would share at this point. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty of other opportunities Thank to get you. into discussion. At the end, food is life, food is identity, food is energies, culture, rituals are connected to food, many things are connected to food. So definitely whenever we gather around the table, we are really celebrating our history. We are celebrating the presence and joining this experience with the people work, talk, not working, eating with us but also kind of it's an act to prepare ourselves for the future. So I really think that coming around the table together is really a magical moment. The things that you share around the table are really probably the, the, the deepest emotions. You, you never lie when you are around the table. So this is really something that uh, is, is something that we, sh we should consider more and more. Thank you so much, Nikki. And now, we have to talk about business also. We have to talk about business and business. How much small and medium enterprise are crucial for the world, for the prosperity of the world. And we want to talk with a professor. So I want to invite Rosemary to join us because I think that we have been talking about educators, activists, farmers, chefs, cooks. And we need to talk also about entrepreneurs now. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, I'm so glad to be part of this meeting. As you heard, my name is Rosemary um, Okello Olale. I work at um, Strathmore, the director of the Africa Media Hub, where I'm the head of the media, but also I'm doing data analytics. And one of the areas I've been working in is actually agribusiness. More importantly, also, I've been actually doing storytelling uh, using Gender 5 as a kind of mainstreaming. And the what I'll be presenting is, uh, maybe I can share. Uh, um, uh, what I'm presenting is how actually women are, uh, uh, the previous speakers you heard how women have been resilient and how women have been using technology to actually feed their, not only their house, but the nation. Uh, as you all know, I'm coming from Africa where uh, three quarters of farmers, especially small scale farmers are actually populated by women and women have been seen as the poor. Um, I want to actually, how do I? Sorry, I want to, how do I share? You are already sharing, we are watching. You're watching it, okay. Yeah, 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 it's perfect. Uh it's perfect yes yeah, 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 yeah. how women are feeding the nation using technologies especially in our part of the world and this is a um, um, um previously as you can see in this in this photo women have been resilient despite even the challenges of technology the challenge of not accessing land challenges of not accessing for uh, finance women have been resilient in ensuring that their family are fed there are case studies we've done where even with only one dollar, a woman can fill the whole family of six children and they can make sure that women, children get balanced diet. And clearly it's not about even the ecosystem that makes them not uh, feed the nation, but that kind of uh, passionate and resilient of ensuring that the nation is fed. And through that resiliency, uh, the countries have been able to achieve almost 75% of food security in areas of developing countries. Here, I'm showing that how technology now is actually rechanging, reshaping women resiliency in agricultural produce. And even though they are data literate and technological literate, they still actually use this technology to achieve the five things I'm going to talk about, food, nutrition and dietary, uh, nutrition and dietary, 
Through that technology, I will be looking into efforts made by women to provide quality and nutritious food to their family. Post-harvest technology, which constitutes an interdisciplinary science and te techniques applied to agriculture commodities after harvest. Many a times there has been a lot of wastage and now we're using such technology, they are able actually to enhance uh, food security. Digital technologies like uh, 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 Bitcoin, blockchain, it has been used to assess the input of women in the use of computer-based technology and improve their food security. Biotechnology is an area again that is being used while women actually in a county in Kenya, a rural county, they're using animal insemination to actually enhance I mean, animal um, a genetic improvement to supply adequate and response of the changes in the food demands. Smart agriculture, I'll be sharing a, um, with a woman who has been able to become supplier of potatoes to um, KFC and um, some of the restaurants in Nairobi, being a small scale farmer actually to, food the, to feed the nation. So the next one, um, looking at nutrition and, and, and uh, dietary. Here's a case where in February 2020, 1.3 million people, especially 9% population, which we analyze are estimated to have faced food crisis and worse acute food insecurity. And the following efforts have been made by women to address malnutrition. In um, some place, actually, in a, uh, a woman called Wanjiro, uh, Wanjiro here, um, I've been using what we call Food for Education, uh, a program that is actually pioneered by Wanjiro that cooks prepare and distribute food, um, nutritious meals at subs uh, subsidized prices to over 2000 school children in humble background in some area in Kenya where uh, they are poor. And they have integrated technology called tap to eat using a phone. And this program is a digital mobile platform that uses cutting edge uh, FinTech to enable pub uh, public primary schools uh, children access nutritious food for education. So they go to school and when they go to school, tap to eat, they'll be able to access the food. So parents can pay as little as uh, $0.5 for the subsidized uh, lunches, which actually they can afford using mobile money. And um, the amount is actually accredited to virtual wallet linked to the NFC smart uh, wrist band which students used to then they wear when they're going to school so that the teachers will be able to know they have paid. And the other thing also, the, well, the health of the family. And then cricket and worms for protein in, protein, uh, in pro porridge is an initiative at um, a, rift, uh, a career valley, rift valley place called Kenya. It was started by Caroline Kipkoech, an entomologist from JQYAT. Uh, in partnership with Sunrise Children Home that aims at improving the nutrition of children like in the life of a baby Sharon Kipto. And uh, because now baby Sharon actually was malnourished. And because of that, baby Sharon has been able to actually uh, enhance her, he her health and be able to actually run. He was not, she was not able to run before. Again, using of breast pumps for sufficient breastfeeding the importance of breastfeeding uh, is, is cannot be overrated. And with an increased demand, nursing women are to resume work before their babies. So they are using actually pumps to eat so that they can increase breast milk. The other area I like to is post harvest. So there's what we call the cool pot technology. Essentially works by tricking the normal air conditioning thermostat to go as low as 10 C which is below the manufacturing standard of low waste temperature at 18%. And the goodness with this technology, uh, it can also use what we call the solar energy. And this saves the farmers to, to prolong shelf life of perishable agriculture products. So the color post was introduced in Kenya by Dr. Jane Ambuko, who is an associate professor at the University of Nairobi in partnership with the University of Carolina Davis and other organizations. And since the mango farmers in one of the areas in Kenya called Makwini County is actually on the highest demand, Kenya have been able to gain from this technology and is used to spread the whole region and women actually are benefiting from it. So other technology that have been overseen by Dr. Ambuko and Professor Margaret Yesang, Hutchinson and also Judy 
are also uh, value addition technology for dry processing on electric and solar EG for avocado, as well as also um, waxing, modifying atmosphere, packaging, as well as uh, external uh, product. Therefore, we can say that also digital technology, uh, the M firm founded in 2010 by Jamila Abbasa, a computer scientist from Kenya in collaboration with the Susan, Eva and Linda has been actually uh, given space for women, small scale farmers. The organization started with, is now matured technology based solution that offer fair prices discovery for women smallholder farmers. And as I said before, women could just only farm, but even accessing market was a problem. So with this digital technology M farm, they have been able to develop strong relationship with farmers and stakeholders where they buy their products and they become the supply chain and they're able to create market for them locally and internationally. And the model which involves creating the infrastructure required to move goods from the farm to the market. So actually now ordinary women can move their goods from farm to market. The other one is smart technology agriculture, where women have gravitated towards less labor and less land intensive agriculture. And um, they're entering into other areas like snail farming, mushroom farming, black soldier fly farming, vertical farming. These areas women were not actually inter integrating into. They're just doing what we call the core products like maize, beans, but now they're able to in uh, enter into such kind of products. So one of these things is that women are using technology to enhance um, uh, the, the, the production of their, of their work and, their, and even by technology, which they never actually thought of, they never even could know even what it means. They have been able to understand it using their local language. And a case study of Ms. Njeri Mihaki of uh, Greystock Farms in Roni Limuru in central part of Kenya as a good a thing on to say about how agribusiness venture is actually seedling production. She uses tissue culture to rapidly multiply seeds for farmers and the mainly propagated crops as succulent stem, one like bananas. Artificial insemination is also another area. And one of the leaders, um, the governor charity Ngilu, in 2019 in Kitui County, also in Kenya, launched the mass artificial insemination with a target of improving on the quality of livestock breeds, both for dairy and for beef. And they, they believe that of course, uh, they have been able to actually 60,000 livestock keeping household in Kitui can produce only, uh, before that can produce only five liters of milk per house. But now it has increased to 300,000 liters per day. And this retail at 50 per, uh, per, per liter, that is the Kenya shillings, which is almost like uh, for 0.5 dollars. And it will be able to make the women make almost 1.5 million uh, per year, at, at up to um, 45 million per year. So looking at um, women using technology, we are seeing is actually breaking new grounds. We are seeing that even though the majority are not part of it, it's creating an interest in financial technology, it's creating an interest in also stakeholders uh, participation, it's creating an interest in government creating policy to enhance this, as well as also other international partnership getting involved in this. I thank you. Thank you so much. Because actually I was saying before, science now is crucial. And if we need to advance fast and move fast towards the 2030 agenda, that is the goal, we need to accelerate also the digital transition and we need to bring science more and more to help farmers and to help the industry to drive this transition so thank you so much for sharing those stories thank you, thank you. and then we have teresa that is helping us to connect all the dots because yes. Teresa, i i have been reading about your story many years with slow food many talks around the world inspiring people and overall connecting the farm and the table so please yeah. teresa you're the the perfect uh, say ending uh, <laughs> for this first journey yeah i'm bringing the dessert here right to finish the meal <laughs> exactly exactly yeah 
So, well, I'm, I'm Teresa. I'm a designer formerly and a chef. Uh, I had a restaurant for 40 years that was closed uh, because of the pandemic. And now I came back to school and I'm doing a master's degree in design to work uh, the communication in rural areas between you know, farmers and cooks and, and consumers. So what a group, <laughs> how many wonderful things I've heard. You know, I've heard Charles talking about colonization and decolonization is one of the items I've been studying a lot. We in South America, we suffer from this disease and we have to get rid of it. And it's a difficult task because it's part of our lives now. So how can we do this mixing of the past and the future? And Cherry that spoke about the, the youth and agriculture and the power of women, so interesting, so wonderful. And I, I, I was thinking about feminism in rural areas because we know there, there are lots of, uh, of violence and violence with the with the women and also the, the earning of the money. I don't know how it is in, in your countries, but in Brazil, uh, mostly the agriculture, the women in rural areas, they don't earn the money. When they sell stuff, the, the money goes to the men. So this was something I was really shocked. And and then uh, and then uh, Rosemary talking about the the technology, the wonderful, wonderful things that people can have access now, and they really are going to change the world. They're already changing the world. That's why we are here. But I was thinking about uh, our title. When I got the title, I said, Women Who Feed the World. And I was kind of mixed feelings about this title because I, first of all, I thought not only women feed the world, but okay, we have this. Uh, and I was thinking gift, a gift or a sin, I don't know. Um, and I, I was thinking, first of all, of a breast, you know, women as a breast uh, that feed human beings. And how, how tough this is. I don't know about you guys, but for me, it was a tough experience. And second, I was thinking about hand, women as a hand that, you know, uh, help people to go across. And then women as a bridge, because I think today women you know, the energy, the feminine energy is not only in women and in breasts and in hands anymore. It's, it's throughout the world, it's in men, in women, in everywhere. So I, I want to share a little story that happened because I could, I was thinking which story could be more an example of, of what I believe in and what, and what I believe it, that can be the change for the future. And I, I had this story of, uh, Manaus, uh, in the beginning of, of this year, uh, everyone knew that the Amazon was really in a terrible crisis and they didn't have oxygen, which is kind of what a paradox, you know, the, the lung of the world didn't have oxygen for, for, for their people. So I was really worried and I phoned my cook friends there, the eco chefs that we have this group called eco chef. Uh, Nick, Nikki liked the, to say that don't mistake eco chefs by ego chefs. We don't, are, we, we don't follow the ego chefs group. Uh, so I, I phoned my eco chef friend and she said, listen, it's not only oxygen, we are lacking food. There's no food. And I said, what, how, how come the, you know, the birth of biodiversity, the largest biodiversity in the world and people are hungry. So we start to make this movement, this little movement to understand how could we help from Rio, I'm in Rio. So we realized there are some people already giving food, giving away food and organizing to feed those people that, are, that were hungry. But then when they sent me the pictures, it was all processed food all food from supermarkets. And I was, what's going on? You know, what a schizophrenia, you know? We are in a place where there are the most wonderful fruits, fish, manioc, flour, everything, and they are giving stuff that comes from, I don't know where, you know, from China, from, from south of Brazil, we don't know, and, and processed food, which is really bad, especially for traditional population, they, they eat very fresh food all the time. So I, I talked to this lady that I hope we can see the document, the little film she made. 
uh, she sent in the internet. Um, and, I, and I was telling her, uh, we are going to look for some fresh foods to take. And she said, listen, people are sending us onions and garlic and we indigenous people, we don't eat garlic and onions, but we eat fish and manioc flour every day. And they are not sending that for us. So I said, um, who, let's, let's get the, the beginning of the food chain. Let's, let's look at the system. Let's make the thing go around. And then we, we, we contact the farmers, the fishermen, and they also were having problems to, to sell their stuff because of pandemic. So all the food chain was like frozen and people weren't able to connect. So what we did was we, we made this fundraising in our network in Rio and Sao Paulo and other places. We got the money, we sent the money to the local farmers and fishermen and extractivists, and they send their stuff to the indigenous people and the people that were hungry there. So it, with a very, very little effort, in fact, this time was very little act, effort, we could make this wheel go around so nicely. And, and the effect, the effect of it was really like I have, you know, Goosebumps until today when I remember the pictures that they sent me, like the happiness, not only nourishment, not only health, but happiness, which is so important, especially now. And so that, that's the story. And I think really what we need to do is to, to get that feminine energy and to, and to connect and to make this flow of energy that we are seeing in Catalyst 2030, actually. That, that's what it's all about. So to finish, I'd like to ask Julia if she could uh, show the little video. It's in, it's in Portuguese, but I can try to tell you afterwards. You can see the happiness there. Nós da Associação de Mulheres Indígenas Sataremão é a mesma. Agradecemos a rede Unisafra e a rede Maniva e a campanha Alimenta Manaus pela doação dos alimentos orgânicos. Muito obrigada. So th those were the guys receiving the food they should be eating anyway. So that's my story and I hope we can exchange some some questions and answers now. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. This is the celebration of biodiversity. And actually in two weeks, May 22nd is going to be the World Day of Biodiversity. So this is the month where actually we have to remember that and celebrate that. Thank you so much for your story. So now I would love to open the conversation, open to questions, wonderful inspirations. And I would love to start the first question asking what we need now, because we don't have time. We only have almost eight agricultural seasons ahead from now up to 2030. We know how much time it takes to transform agriculture. And we know how much women can become really a powerhouse. They don't need to be in the front stage, but behind the scene, they are really supporting the global ecosystem, connecting the communities around. So what we need now to start from your different perspectives, A big I can jump in. <laughs> I think there is no right question, but I'm pretty sure between this group and uh, the people that are in the room, whoever wants to just, you know, be active in the chat as well with ideas and, and inspirations. Um, what comes to my mind is sort of like a point that I had before. It's, it's all there. Like we have the data. We have the data of if you invest in a woman, um, the return it will give. That's how Yunus actually, you know, started the Grameen Bank as well, making micro donations to women because they knew that this would go beyond um, that family household, beyond the friends that Sarah mentioned before, but really the community in the world. So uh, the data is there. The stories are there because there are, you know, these investments that went into women. We are these beautiful stories that we heard now across just like this little group. So I feel we have the data, the stories um, that prove, that inspire, um, that inspire others to do. There are initiatives to raise awareness. So there's as well, you know, like the awareness building um, pieces. So I, I like your question, like what's missing? Um, and I think just, you know, putting this at the forefront now, because everything, the puzzle pieces are there. So let's connect them and um, 
just, you know, build this awareness and concrete ways to doing it, like simple ways in to actually investing in women. Um, like I was mentioning before, like um, Ethic Hub, Gabriela in, in, um, in Mexico, she's doing that, she's opening these pathways. So almost like thinking of Catalyst 2030, this agro group could open this, this pathway of connecting the science, the stories, the proof, um, and linking it into policies. Because I think Teresa touched upon something that's extremely important, that a lot of the income, especially when it comes to, to farmers, for example, here, and I know this is across Latin America and Africa, it happens um, that the um, income actually goes to the men and as well land ownership. I was writing that in the chat, like the, um, the land ownership is a huge problem. And, and women are the ones that suffer most from it because of very, very old um, old concepts and, and policies, right, behind it. So I feel that the missing element is, I think, that platform, simplicity to, to tap into what exists and the policies behind. But that's just what comes to my mind first. Love to hear from others. <laughs> Can I add into uh, what Niki was saying? Actually, you know, I was mentioning about uh, in the Philippines, We've been pushing for a policy, it's called Magna Carta for women in agriculture, right? And actually that manifested that video that I showed to you earlier, because um, as what Teresa was saying, the payment always goes to the to the men. In the Philippines, it still go to the women, goes to the women, but unfortunately it's um, lesser compared to the men. And at the same time, land titles are not under the women. So that legal responsibility alone is actually hampering them to have access to finance, have access to this, to the opportunities, and more importantly, to to decision making from home because they don't have that power. You know, uh, the land ownership is so powerful, especially in rural areas. But banking onto that, I guess, um, you know, the silver lining. I've been like Teresa, right, doing something in the pandemic. We're also doing something in the pandemic, but I think the silver lining I was getting from this entire conversation in women and what the pandemic is actually causing us is we are living in an ecosystem that everyone is taking responsibility. And hopefully though, in taking this responsibility, we can learn together to find that commonality, you know, to find a common purpose and to find that sense of collaboration that all of us should have a shared prosperity right because in the world it's actually half women so if you empower half women you're empowering the entire world and we're lifting the entire world so how can we have that shared commonality right and collaboration that um after all this that's happening around us after the pandemic hopefully we will not graduate as complacent but we'll graduate from this entire experience not lull that you know we will just sit and do business as usual because after this, we need to build more resiliency, but we really need to have a sense of taking care of each other. And the power of women, the nurturing is coming out. And I get so emotional every time I share this because like today I had an interview with the Asian Development Bank. And the first question was during the pandemic, who are out in the streets? And my first answer, women, you were the first to sell the produce if they were the first to even like drive the truck to bring the produce to the market, they were the first to deliver the produce, you know, to every household so that, you know, people, 12.8 million people stuck in Metro Manila will not go hungry. They were the first to distribute meals to prisons, to mental hospitals, to all hospitals. So they were the first to be out. The nurturing is out. And I think that sense of commonality for service and the sense for service is very important for us to think about. And uh, I can add also about, uh, apart from the stories that are out there, we need to change that narrative. And the narrative is that women have been seen as small scale farmers, but with the pandemic it showcases that women actually are the foundation of food security in household level. And that narrative is to start making policy makers and decision makers to start, how do they frame women's role in agricultural produce, not as small scale farmers, but actually farm to, um, farm to fork and farm to fork, there's so many processes that women, I, women are involved. As Sherry said, they were the first to be in the street here, even actually 
um, identifying digital platform to sell the goods. Women were the first to identify where they could take the goods, use the mobile platform to identify their customers and use their children to send the foods to the household level. And that's how going extra mile to identify actually creative ways and innovative approaches where they can be able to ensure that their household is uh, actually secured when it comes to food access. So changing that narrative and ensuring that investments towards women's as, as agricultural produce is actually related to the work they put in. And that's why making them become part of the decision maker and making their voices heard. Uh, I'd like to follow. And I think sometimes uh, Catalyst was such an important uh, movement that happened in such a weird and important time as well. Um, but I think sometimes we, I still see ourselves as those little squares in the, in the computer screen. Uh, I, I don't feel yet like this becoming a, a dish, a recipe, you know, thinking about the, like a cook, that there are the ingredients here, but let's make a delicious meal. How can we make a delicious meal out of our knowledge, out of our projects? Because many times I came to those lives and I, I saw people like, talking about their, their own projects, which is okay. That's why we are here. But at the same time, that, that doesn't make the connection that we can still become like little dots in the big picture of a, a, a sick world. So how can we connect ourselves? I don't have an answer really, but I think there are many, many types of connections. We saw here like technology connections. Nikki talked about uh, empowering, uh, like investing in women. I think this is really a key issue because of this disconnection of, with the money that in the machista world we, we saw all the time. Uh, and also the, the, the connection of being able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. I think this is one of the biggest changes now at, at our time because we had, we were obliged to change our lives because of pandemic. So people are planting, like Nikki is, has a, a, a chicken. And so many people change their lives. I'm planting things. I, I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't able to cook in my house properly. You know, I was always cooking in the restaurant. So now our lives had, had, had a big, big change. Let's, let's take that and, and make like a, the earth, you know, when you make the earth go, go around and it becomes more fertile but really we have to be able and to be eager to exchange and to break our boundaries, not to hold ourselves to our own projects. Like if we were going to lose more and more, I think we have to gain by connecting, by mixing. Um, and I think Catalyze 2030 is the perfect place to do that. I'm gonna jump in. Thank you so much. Um... Rosemary, Teresa, Cherry, and Nikki for this beautiful shares. And I wanna to try to weave a little bit, um, a few things. Um, and, 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 and an image that came quite strongly um, a few minutes ago was um, a, a lesson or kind of a wisdom that I received from, um, from an, uh, an indigenous elder uh, here in Colombia from the Sierra Nevada. And they would, um, they see food and agriculture as the umbilical cord that connects us, our bodies, to the earth, right? Uh, and I mean, to be extremely powerful. And with some of the challenges that we're facing today, disconnection from self, disconnection from community, disconnection from the earth, I feel that we're, that system, right? And that is the food system, that umbilical cord, agriculture is the food system. We're not connected to the, to the umbilical cord anymore. We're connected to a perfusion, right? A transfusion of nutrients through the system. It's like, you know, in the Matrix movie where, where we're fed, but kind of with machines, that's what's happening. That is the disconnection. That is us, as Teresa was saying, getting foods from abroad for a community that what they need is what they, what they eat on, on, a, on a local, on a daily, on an ancestral basis, right? And so how do we shift that paradigm from 
you know, the, the, the perfusion to the umbilical cord, back to the umbilical cord, the way we evolved for millions of years, the way we were all eating 150 years ago. I mean, it's, this is about remembering more than it is about innovating, I believe, right? And remembering, well, it is a different lifestyle as well. It is Nikki having to run after her chicken. How beautiful to remember how, you know, to run after a chicken and how to feed it properly with the food waste of your kitchen. It's a perfect cycle, right? And they give you the egg for the next morning. It's so beautiful, right? And, and we, it's so simple to remember these things. So how to get there? And I, you know, I, I, I and this is something coming up very strongly is education, education, education. And, 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 and these three education levels, I mean, I feel, um, you know, the, the, you know, from the top, uh, let's say, um, or at top down, I'd let, change the paradigm, let's say from, from, from those who have power, we need to educate them on, on, on these topics. We need to educate them on the importance of food education, because if we are not educated on how to eat, we cannot take good decisions um, when, as consumers. And we fail at taking good decisions on how to show up for those who need most, right? And so that, that is a very important education. Um, I feel also like we need to re-educate and rethink the way we understand value. Uh, Anthony, before living, said, something like how do we empower women or farmers to gain value from their produce that goes beyond the ability to sell products on their market? Well, we need to think of value beyond monetary value. That's just one way of measuring it, right? So how to bring back value because value is power and, 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 and you know, they go hand in hand. Um, uh, value is energy in terms of that kind of power, right? Um, and um, in that sense, how do we truly empower uh, and there's something really that I resonate with that Katie said also on the chat, how do we educate men, right? And as the only men in, in, in the panel, I feel very honored and very humbled to be uh, here and to, to, to be able to share my voice. But I do think that I, you know, and in my personal journey, it's not been easy to really understand the biases embedded in society on every scale that favorize um, certain types of people over another, right? There is no real kind of um, uh, equality um, uh, going on in this world. And, and that requires very powerful education. I mean, pervasive education also for men to understand their, their role more as supporters of women rather than just, um, you know, um, kind of this, this broken system that, that we have in terms of the interaction between masculine and feminine. As Elif said so nicely earlier on the chat, women are tenders. And I wanted to say also like the feminine is tender, is tending, right? It's about tending. And so how do we teach tending, which is a feminine leadership trait to everyone? Because, uh, you know, it, it, it's been kind of lost a little bit. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, we're facing very complex issues, but, but, but really kind of, you know, scaling up education to the millions, to the billions around solutions, um, and sometimes, again, as I said, it's more about remembering than, than, than innovating. The story that I shared about Sandra Peñalosa here in, in Uzme in Bogota, um, she used an ancestral seed and realized that she did not have to spend all these expensive um, uh, pesticides and, and, uh, and, and you know, imported products in order to fertilize her land. She just needed to change the seed that she was planting. And she said also, that the biggest struggle is that Bogota people, the consumers, do not eat that potato because they do not, they, they do not know it. They do not even know that that potato, which is called the cubio, it's kind of this carrot-shaped, delicious, raw, cooked, incredible product from a culinary standpoint, from a, from a flavor standpoint, right? from a pleasure standpoint, a very, very beautiful seed. And it is not being consumed by the masses because people don't know. So we need that cool your route to be on television on netflix or something for people to realize oh i want to eat that right and that crop does not require any type of machinery or any type of uh, like bigger machinery or any type of pesticides because it is evolved naturally in this ecosystem and it's really about tuning back into the land and there comes again this uh, this uh, we need to combine the best of science as sarah was 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 talking and the, and the speed um, that uh, and as rosemary was talking the best of technology with ancestral wisdom, because technology itself will not is not a solution; uh, it's just a tool. Um, so, ancestral wisdom, ancestral seeds, which is also something that 
woman used to do. I met an indigenous woman a few a few a few months ago in in Mexico, uh, who not only gives she helps give birth and she also is a farmer, right? She she tends the seed of life. She is the art that you know she tends life for her community through farming and through helping women deliver life, right? And so and 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 she was saying how important this this seed keeping is, right? So how do we become seed keepers again? as well, which is a feminine trait. Anyways, that I extend, I overextend a little bit. But thank you so much for listening. I I got really, I got so, so much more went into my mind. Sorry, Sarah. But like, I was like, yes, and then jumping. So I think my mind is all over Charles as usual when, <laughs> when you bring your inspiration. Um, but one thing, and it brings as well, connect the dots to what Teresa was saying, like bringing again, the role of women, right? And, and ancestral, because the, the role of women looking back at history was a very much different role. So how did we disconnect from that? Like actually women were honored. And, and so there is not only the disconnect between us and earth, us as people, um, us and what we're eating, um, but there's also this disconnect of the role of women. Looking back, they were, they were worshiped, and, um, but not for just their beauty, but they were worshiped for what we're bringing to society. So I think looking back at, at history and, and ancestral knowledge, um, I find it um, so key, so absolute key. And it comes back to that. Women were nourishing just by breastfeeding. Nature created us to nurture the next generations. Like, like there's, you know, like <laughs> nature. And we're part of that ecosystem in a way. And so I think looking back at the ancestral and whoever's interested in that, by the way, uh, we're doing at SGM a, um, a UN Food Systems Dialogue um, on exactly that, how ancestral knowledge can inform the uh, farming of the future. So I think, uh, yeah, definitely a, a piece to look at. Sorry, Sarah, back to you. <laughs> uh, can I just add something, Sarah? Go, 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 please. Women were also burned in fire. Remember that, Nikki. It's a power, it's a dangerous power we have. And we have to, people have to stop, stop fearing that. And we have to stop fearing that, mostly. If I may add something, um, yeah. Teresa. So, um, uh, I just may add something to that from, it's not um, the balance of um, life and the relationship between, you know, the living and the passing in Maori culture. We've, we have, um, we, we really embrace this and it's starting to become, uh, coming back to what Charles and Nicola were talking about. I'm, I'm currently working, uh, pushing those foundations of industries that are starting to respect their wahine more and respect the process of um, woman and development of um, food health and sustainability. And I think it's, Brilliant, you know. I was apologies. I jumped in late on this um, on this um, discussion, but yeah. So with to Mana Consortium, that's exactly what what Charles was talking about. Um, it takes time. We've been we've been driving the healthy healthy fenua, healthy land, is healthy families, which equals healthy children, and in that relationship, you are able to um, go and do your work, and then the social disconnection that people are having. Uh, it's starting to, you know, it's starting to infiltrate back home and we're reincorporating some of our traditional um, uh, policies that we had in place. We're um, in Māori culture. I don't know if you know much about it, but um, wahine are the, the core fundamental of our circular life cycle. And so uh, when I mean wahine, it means woman in, in English. And so they've always been the core base of it, but because of... Um, industrialization colonization and all these factors that is actually you know being pushed aside but it's coming back in new zealand anyway and i'm sure it's coming in all the other areas that um that are there for everyone to contribute to so we look forward to helping the cause um from aotearoa in some small small way Sarah, <laughs> you want to jump back on? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you so much. Actually, what we are saying is uh, going back to our ancestral values. And I was 
just typing in the chat, probably the golden rule is one of the principles that we need to bring back. I'm mom of two boys. So of course I'm, I'm making many questions to myself every single day because we have really now to push uh, to try to build a more equitable world for all and to make it inclusive for all. And I'm wondering myself every single day, I'm, how might I educate them in a way that tomorrow when they're gonna be adults, that when they're gonna be fathers, they can really raise a new generation that cannot face what we have been facing until now. So I think that what we're talking now about is bringing back uh, in education essential values. Mm. Which brings us back to the education piece, right? And I think there's so many unknown. So we like, still have just eight minutes. Let's take advantage of these eight minutes to save the world. I leave the stage to you guys. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. I want to throw out a question to, to us, all of us that are not only that, are, that have been sharing the stories, but everyone just like Jason, you know, jump in, I would say, because there is, uh, you know, so much knowledge. That's what Catalyst is about, right? We're here from, from like between peers. And I think that's the beauty. So don't be shy. <laughs> but um, I have a question because there are things, you know, thinking of a restaurant world um, that, that some of us are very closely connected with as well, like in there are fewer than seven percent of head chefs, and 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 those women in the restaurant industry are earning twenty eight percent less, like in norm, uh, than the men. And uh, I was talking about the struggles of those those women being cooks and chefs, actually, because there is so much more on their backs as well. Like Sarah was saying, there's a family I'm taking care of. So I wonder, like, how? Because these are again coming back to the facts. The numbers are out there. Of like, <laughs> so how can we come together? So it brings us a little bit to Teresa's um, point as well. How can we move from like sharing inspiration stories, doing our projects, but how can we really shift the paradigm? And I, I, I'm curious because because we have that power. We are us already as a group, right? So how can we go from this collaboration in theory to collaboration in action? I think when we approach it from the restaurant point of view, we need to look at it. How do we make waste management become a resource for women. And here's a case where, because of the waste management program that is going on as a result of carbon zero, uh, carbon, uh, carbon, print, uh, carbon print zero, we need to look at how then women can take advantage of the wastage in the restaurants to actually create a resource that can create higher value resources to them a waste management will be a key area we need to look into in that area. Yeah, that's really important. And I, I also, you know, I'm feeling lots of fire inside of like, oh, what needs to happen, right? Like, where do we all kind of create a cohesive uh, star narrative and add our voices, right? So one question I had is what is the most um, kind of, um, beautiful initiative out there that we can all support. Of course, there's the SDGs. Of course, there's, you know, organizations that are global, like the social gastronomy movement um, and all the work that many of us are doing, right? But but what is that hashtag? What is, I, I don't know. And, and I'm not necessarily asking for, a, for an answer here. I'm just kind of just calling it in to arrive, to, to, to really put this. And, and I think in terms of how we structure power um, and leadership, uh, when it comes to kitchens, but when it comes to any type of uh, structures of power, and one idea right that keeps on coming back is like, how do we shift from uh, pyramidal structures and hier hierarchical structures that are like this uh, to some more circular decision-making processes? This is something that I'm exploring myself in trying to think of how can a kitchen work without a chef, for example. So of course we need more women chef, but also how do we decentralize leadership? So it's not just on one point because it's a very masculine thing, right? If you think about it, the womb and the feminine kind of trade is more like a container, right? And the, and, and the masculine is more like, like um, you know, pointing, right? Um, and so um, thinking of how we also shift power structures completely is 
a feminine endeavor. Um, and, uh, um, and, and of course, putting more women in leadership is definitely uh, the, a key part of that. Um, and, um, and it's definitely something that uh, won't be easy and we need to help each other figure out the best ways forward. Um, but, but yeah, I think that I just, you know, I feel that kind of, um, um, as, as Teresa was saying, there's a lot of power and it cares a lot of people. <laughs> uh, historically as well, um, and systemically, uh, women's leadership has been suppressed uh, uh, even from um, you know, a religious perspective, um, you know, and so I think it's it. Uh, I mean, modern religion, um, or let's say the, the monotheistic ones. Um, so I, I think it's really important to to just kind of lift all that up. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I would say, from my point of view, we need space and time. I think uh, we have this space which is catalyst and we have this time of the lives and, and the meetings. But I think we need a little bit more than that because I think we need the place to meet. And it's, it's not only the two people meeting because we have something in common and we like business as usual, we, we have a goal to achieve that. I think we need like a sitting room, like a living room, like a kitchen, like a place that we can meet and talk about issues but in a freer way. And I think pandemic staying for a while, it's a wonderful way to you know, keep up with it. I think instead of having just like very objective places and, and spaces to talk, maybe we should lose ourselves a little bit you know, in space, but with themes, of course, we are not going to meet everyone in the Catalyst, but I think um, I think we should have like spaces. I don't know how in in like in technology, but I think that's not difficult. Like to have a space to just exchange ideas and not to be so objective, to be more reflective. And I think this can help a lot. Letting things emerge. I want to add to Teresa's point, actually, you know, that space is so important just for, uh, for us women to talk our issues to be heard, more importantly to be heard, right? Uh, actually, um, in, in Southeast Asia case, right, we're launching, we launched the Grow Her platform. It's because of that. Everyone is asking for a space when you are consulting different countries in Asia Pacific. What, what space can we provide for women? So that's actually the reason we launched Grow Her. And now each country is scheduling to launch it individually in their country. So Philippines, next Indonesia, Vietnam, and the domino effect is somehow happening. And hopefully, you know, it will happen in a big way. But at the end of the day, um, in terms of the, for example, the question of me here, right, on restaurants and things like that. Um, Right now, I'm involved in gender responsive procurement. It's actually one of the things that we signed up, you know, in the first presentation or present a while ago with the Women Empowerment a Principle of the UN. Uh, the gender responsive procurement is now actually one of the things that we enforced all the private sector to implement. That in your procurement, no matter how big your company is, multinationals, micro, small, medium enterprises, there must be an intentionality in your policy, in your purchasing policy, in your hiring, that there must be women, not only in the supply chain, but really on leadership chain. It goes actually towards counting the membership of women in farming associations and cooperatives, going to that level and making sure that in these farmer cooperatives and associations of smallholder farmers, there are women in leadership position because we said that if we cannot afford to audit what is the groundwork from, from the farmers, right? If the world is talking about sustainability and traceability and all these big multinational companies will just audit their traceability up to their last supplier. Our demand now is how do we go deeper? Is this so end supplier is really going deeper in traceability, going to the farmer 
cooperatives and associations that women are given voices here and they have leadership position. So it needs to trickle down because once it will trickle down, it will have a stronger foundation. That's what actually what Charles was saying. It's really more of a basin, right, than more of a pyramid. So that's what we're trying to do right now in terms of policy and involvement of the private sector to make this happen. <laughs> Before ending, like just jumping in on on the, and I love everything you said as usual. <laughs> I think about looking at it from this perspective. Um, what about because there's an initiative that two of our community members are doing with Grubhub and World Central Kitchen, uh, restaurant her. So I was just thinking when I grow her, restaurant her. So linking back to what Rosemary was saying about changing the narrative. So maybe there is this action that's emerging without having been connected. So. Uh, just throwing it out for food for thought. <laughs> Sada, back to you. I know your, your connection was a little unstable. Yeah, thank you so much, Nikki. Yes, actually, thank you so much. This session has been amazing. I think there are tons of learnings and inspiration that we all have to spread around. Balance, education. I was saying the golden rule, reciprocity and ancestral values and sharing and connection. There's so much to do. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the Catalyst Network. Uh, please go back and see the sessions. Tons of inspiring uh, change makers have been joining this group uh, during the week. And thank you so much, Mark Brand, that has been organizing all of that, giving us the opportunity to come together and share all of those inspiring stories. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, so everyone, for this space. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Let's hope to come.